This is SciBite, episode 49, for June 5th, 2012. Hi everyone, you're listening to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. This show comes out every Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us, like every single week, is our host. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey Heather, happy science to you. Happy science. What do we have coming up in this week's episode of SciBite? This week, we're going to take a look at new rehabilitation for spinal cord injuries, nanotech medical devices, Guinness Bubbles, Tomatoes, a quiet room, tornado maps, spacecraft updates, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Wow, quite a bit of stuff. And I noticed you just yes. kind of slipped uh, Guinness bubbles in there. And by the way, pre-show, yes. because we, we got an early start today, and you haven't mentioned anything about that story. So I'm no. interested in that. That sounds yes. like uh, it might be up my alley. Now, I should say, yeah. uh, we started early this week because it's kind of a special night. Yes. And I kind of got in the spirit of things, and I brought up one of the live streams of the Venus transit. Oh, um, yes. And uh, I should I should give that guy credit. If I'll look for it while I talk about it. But uh, very cool to watch. You know, I, unfortunately, the cloud coverage here isn't going to make it to be something that I can see. And, you know, the time isn't quite right anyways. But yeah, very neat to be able to just kind of tune in and see that. Now, you got to watch a little bit. What do you think? I did. I had it uh, marked for the end of the show. Oh, we can get into it now. No, no, no. See, just, no you just, can hang on. Hang no, on I just, all no, I didn't cool mean. I didn't mean stories. to. I didn't mean to talk on the topic. It I just mean. So I just meant awesome. in I terms of like it. the opportunity. I did get to see it. I got to show. You know, look at it. Got to see it online. Got to see yeah. it, real life. No, we it can was, save. You don't have to say. You don't have to say anymore. It was amazing. Don't say any more than that. I I'm just excited. wanted to give it credit because uh, it's it is the elephant in the room for tonight's episode because yes. it's happening right now as we record. Yes. So all right, but we will save the topic because Heather has gone. And I've gotten a bunch of really interesting details. So why don't we move right on and get into the news? What is our first news story? Spinal cord injury treatment. So actually, when you think about a spinal cord injury, you think, you know, the spinal cord's been cut. Like you cut a piece of celery. But it's not really that. They're very few who actually like completely sever the spinal cord oh okay that makes sense. most of them just like sever part of them or crush crush part of the nerve fibers in the spine right so it's going to damage some things and you know things can't communicate from the brain down the nervous system right so these are you know those are things that you know do that and they don't really regrow in adults so once they've been smashed it doesn't really work um We've tried various things to regrow them, growth factors, stem cells, and their therapies. Nothing really works in the long run. So what they've done now is they have, um, they sort of approximated the injuries in rats. So they had the spinal cord and they made two little cuts. Like on, uh, you know, say the left side was cut and then the right side was cut a little ways away. So that, you know, there's complete disconnection all the way, but it's not like completely severed. So then what they did was they took them and they had them in a severe rehab regimen. So, you know, trying to force it, um, essentially think of it like uh, the highway's been closed down. So the highway's closed down, traffic's backing up. Oh my gosh, locals know where there's some back roads. Everybody starts going on the back roads. Okay. And the back roads start getting more. So that's what you're doing. You're trying to move uh, essentially the traffic out of the you're, main thoroughfares. So you're rerouting? Yeah, you're kind of rerouting things. You're trying to convince things to go a different way. Interesting. So they can do, you know, do that. And so the other have, nerves can essentially carry the same signals that the original path would have if, if somehow the, the signals can yeah, be sent can, across them. Yeah. It can try to, to bite bypass. It can try to be a, a detour route. You wow. Know, your, that's fascinating. So th- they're trying to force it to, to do that and how to make communication go past these cuts. So what they, um, what they did during these physical therapy sessions was they, you know, 30 minutes a day. So it was, you know, a pretty good chunk uh, physical therapy session. And they injected them with a cocktail of drugs that was actually to help uh, the neural circuits um, to speed them up, to be able to to have 
leg movements go on. So they kind of prepped all this, all the um, the nerves in the spine. Then they hooked, essentially put it up with little uh, electrodes and, you know, hit off the electrodes to make the muscles move. So they're kind of doing both of these things. So what they were able to do is put a little rat in a harness, attach it to a little robotic device, kind of held it up, you know, so it's not like using all of its weight, you know, had a little track going around or, you know, a piece of food or something in front of it, you know, and makes it want to move forward. Right. So kind of between the drugs and the electrical stimulation, they're able, at first they couldn't move at all. After a couple of weeks, they began taking a couple steps forward. They tried to move forward. Um, Hmm. By about five or six weeks, they were actually able to initiate the movement all on their own to sort of walk towards the food and kind of get to the food. Oh, my gosh. So in the visual version that we have of this show, Uh uh, I just watched a real rat walk. That's really amazing. Yeah. Now, if it's not, you know, Akira, the... It's not, you know, you apply the stimulation and it's it works forever. Mm. It's um, kind of like a battery pack. You know, it'll, you know, you have your little uh, robotic toy and it moves around. If you pop the 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 batteries out, it doesn't do anything. If you have the battery batteries back in and it can move around, this is sort of the same thing. It needs that stimulation. Now it helps if you they want to move. You know, right, it's okay, moving. Sure. So there's some sort of stimulation that wants to go. So they want to do this. It's not just any any movement that's going on. It's not, like you saw, it's them actually moving. Yeah. You know, sometimes we've seen it where you can stimulate the muscle and just kind of make it jerk. You know, if you see everyone's ever, anyone's ever seen like a little electrode put it on the arm, you know, and it sends a little shock and your fingers, fingers can jerk a bit. This is actually, essentially, um, building a little pathway, you know, building a side road in order to drive on. But think of it like, um, I know, like in a game, like a laser, you know, a, a, a force field bridge. So you can kind of drive over on it to get bypass the, you know, the wreck on the highway or the spinal, spinal cord injury. But it won't use the bypass unless this device is powered. Yes. Hmm. It's, you know, it, it lets that happen. So, you know, but it's so much further and it's, you know, this combination of the the rehab, the drugs, the Mm -hmm. stimulation, the robot assisted therapy. So, I mean, in this beginning trial, it is, it's saying the stimulation has to be there. You know, the, Mm -hmm. they're holding up the rat. So it's not taking all of its weight yet, but it is actually moving its legs in a, I want to get to that food because it is yummy. Bring it to me now. When you were researching this, did you get any uh, indication of the amount of power? Is it, is it like something that could be, Are we talking something like a pacemaker requires or are we talking like, you know, a significant charge is required? I, off the top of my head, I didn't really see any uh, voltage or amperage notices. This could be, I mean, rats um, scaling it up. How much does that change? But I mean, if it's something like, you know, maybe it requires as much juice as an iPad. I mean, yeah, it sounds kind of funny, but the iPad's actually got a pretty serious battery in there, right? So if you could use that, I just just don't know how much it would take. I mean, yeah, I mean... The other part of it is, you know, the rats are being suspended. So if the if the muscles are there to to be able to hold you up, you know, if the muscles in your legs are strong enough, you know, and some spinal cord injuries, you're there, you know, you're incapacitated long enough that the muscles in your legs start going down, just like um, you lose muscle mass in space. Mm-hmm. So it's, do you have the muscle mass to be able to hold yourself up? So if it's that, even, I mean, think of it, I mean, back in the 80s, fanny packs, um, you know, you know, a battery that big, even, you know, just around your waist, or you can, you can walk or be able to do those type of things. Yeah. Think about two kind of uh, some of the calculated coldness that is required in some of this, uh, some of this science. Uh, so they had to, they had to injure these these rats, which is, you know, unfortunate. But then they had to hook them up to mm-hmm. this chemical cocktail electrolysis combo for a while before they even saw any results. So they just kind of had to just do it for a little while, yeah. even though they couldn't move, you know, but hoping that the outcome would be what the science indicates it might be. And then it comes true. Yeah, there is a whole, 
there's a whole industry of making these, or there's a you know a chunk of the science community that uses these. Uh, there's like meta uh, strains of rats and mice and stuff that they can specifically use for various things. Oh yeah, um, I mean I'm not really so much commenting on the use of a rat so much as having to uh, assume that shocking it and sh- shooting up with cocktails will lead to this sort of uh, pathway oh, creation, right? I mean that's oh, that's a brilliant leap of faith. No, it's uh, most of these are always led by. Uh, theories and chemical, sure, yeah. you know, you, you have some, um, you know, some spinal cord cells in a Petri dish and you see what happens if you do right. this or that and you make you just all keep these scaling things. it up. Yeah. As, yeah. I mean, I get it. You, know, you, you check out all the little bits and pieces to make all the best guesses about what has to happen. I just find it, then, it's, it's a fascinating way to look at the process that they have to go through to, to develop something yeah. like this. And it, you know, tweaking of this and tweaking of that to make sure what works, you know, and yeah, yeah. scaling it up to humans. Now, right. there has actually been uh, reports of voluntary movements in uh, a gentleman who was paralyzed in a vehicle accident. Now, he went a whole combination of electrical stimulation and physical therapy. And there's uh, a couple other patients that are going through similar things. But they're hoping that the addition of a specific uh, drug therapy or drug cocktail like they gave these these rats might help increase that, you know, make it better. Well, and the other advantage you have if this ever if this kind of thing could expand to humans is you could actually tell the human and you could work to develop like specific exercise yeah. regimes that would help. Whereas with the rat, they're only going to get so much, you know, two way. I mean, there's not a lot they can do to get them to do the things to specifically build yeah. those muscles back or build that back. For yeah, example. it's, you know, you have a little little treadmill and you have a piece of cheese in front of hungry yeah, rat. Yeah, I it mean, goes, that is a lot food, of incentive, food, but. Food. Uh, but there's no incentive like somebody who's been really injured and wants to get back on their feet and get back to work and has a goal and maybe has a, you know, oh yeah so that the, you know that be exciting you know there's that communication you know there's somebody who really wants to have this happen. Friend of the family you know? of mine is working with uh, uh, the military to develop an exoskeleton for paralyzed people. Oh yeah, sort of a different approach, right? Yeah. This is sort of trying to fix it internally with mm-hmm. minimal external technology, where that approach is entirely external. Um, well, like I was saying earlier, for people with uh, reduced muscle mass that can't support themselves, uh, a combination of the two could work. Right. Where you have the exoskeleton that can help support you. Yeah. And have, you know, everything hooked up so that your nerves are wanting to to move everything. And that sort of, that helps you train the muscles. Essentially, you have to kind of either train for the first time or retrain all your muscles to use them the right way to walk. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Crash Benedict in the uh, Crash Bandicoot, as I like to call him, in the chat room, where he says, you know, like kind of like you're saying, exoskeleton plus this technology, really it just comes down to uh, the batteries. Yeah. And if we can develop battery technology or some sort of power source technology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Creepy Uncle says you could use the exoskeleton for uh, the exercise regime. <laughs> yeah. So that might well, work. I don't know. <laughs> well, like, that was what I was saying is, you know, you have the exoskeleton maybe you're during your physical therapy session yeah, you have your yeah. little um you know it's you in your physical therapy mode and it helps you walk just the right way that you should so you're like oh this right that's right this has to go here that goes there it helps retrain your muscles about what to do because you're not always thinking okay lift up left leg put heel right. down right and it, well an exo uh, an exo exoskeleton <laughs> as i want to call it the exo yeah. the exoskeleton could be sort of programmed to do like a specific progressive, uh, yeah. you know, increase or decrease of its assistance. So it could sort of dynamically give you sort of more, more exercise resistance or less depending yeah. on what your regime calls for. Yeah. That'd be pretty neat. That'd be pretty neat. Well, uh, Heather, any other thoughts on that story? No, it has a lot of, a lot of potential and a lot of promise. And, you know, you, you know, you've known somebody at the front of the family. I've known people mm-hmm. that have sort of, that would need this kind of technology and it's, it's very promising. And I hope that in years down the line that maybe we'll see something uh, step this forward. Yeah. And it's interesting too, to sort of now see a whole nother approach to this. Cause I've been, you know, since he's a friend of the family, I've been watching the ex. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. The, he even has a cooler name for it, but uh, yeah. I forget what the name is. I've been watching that, you know, really from the concept phase to now the testing trials, this is a completely different approach. And it's interesting to see the mm-hmm. two happening, happening kind of at the same time. Yeah. I've seen the electrical stimulation, uh, um, my father worked with a, a gentleman who, um, who's in a helicopter crash and injured his spinal cord and was at, uh, through some experimental program had essentially little electrodes hooked up to his spine 
that sort of helped him sort of walk kind of jerkily short distances. Um, uh, you know, back in the day. Or <laughs> Oh, really? How long ago? Uh, Vietnam era. Okay, yeah. Yep, interesting. Uh, all right, Heather. Well, uh, why don't we take a uh, quick break here because our chat room has suffered a net split right here during oh, the middle no. of the show. So we lost like a lot of the people in our chat room. So while they're all coming back in, I would like to remind everyone that these shows right here on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, here's what's really cool. Minimal advertising in all yeah. of our shows. And uh, the reason we can do that is because the awesome viewers and listeners like yourself think of us before they go over to sites like Amazon and Newegg and ThinkGeek and Best Buy and Audible and Gamefly. And uh, if you're going to do some shopping there, you go to the bottom of jupiterbroadcasting.com and you can click on one of those links first and it'll tag your shopping session and give us credit for it. And uh, one way you might uh, want to use that link to your advantage is to pick up a new copy of Guild Wars 2, which is out for pre-order yes. right now, Heather, and there is a special bonus, isn't there? Yes, there is. Pre-order this week, you're going to be able to get a hold of the, to play in the, uh, the, op- the beta this weekend. And in addition to that, if you pre-order, you'll be getting a three-day um, Head start. early access. Yeah, That's right. I think standard. I think standard is only one day. But if you pre-order yeah. this week, you get the three-day, and you also yes. get in on the open beta weekend. But you gotta yes. get it this week. So if you've been thinking about Guild yep. Wars Two, we will have a link in the show notes where you can pick that up, or just click on one of those links at the bottom of Jupiter Broadcasting before you go over to like Amazon or Newegg. Yep. Uh, I think this is one of those that I actually got to play uh, a little bit of a closed beta on. Oh yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's it's a very different experience. It's not you walk up to this person, you know, per se, they have a little explanation point over their head or a little star and you go, hi, and they go, please save my dogs. Go round up the chickens. It's very uh, cyclical. So there's like something going on. And I was like, oh no, there's raiders attacking the city. <laughs> yeah. So you log in. Now, if your friend logs in an hour later, what's happening in the city depends on what's happened between when you logged in and when he logged in. Yeah, okay, so it is so so, if, it's sort of the, persistent in that If the sense. Armada is, like, attacking the city and it's going down, he's going to come in and, ha- and his part is going to have to be trying to drive them back, you know, or save the city. So that's, wow, yeah, it's okay. very, it's so very it's, persistent. I like happy. that. So, you know, that's what a lot of people said they wanted in Star Trek Online is some, you know, mm-hmm. territory PvP kind of stuff where, it, you know, kind of there's actually a difference in the game made when your team wins or loses. Yeah. The, you know, the buzz is huge. The buzz is so big that uh, they uh, they even uh, made it some buzz of their own in the media saying that we're doubling our servers for the Guild Wars 2 beta. Yeah. Because beta weekend's going to kick off and we're expecting a huge crowd, so we're doubling our servers. <laughs> yeah. Well, it totally makes sense. Any type of game like this where, you know, you have a big beta weekend, you want it to go off as smoothly as you can. Yeah, because it's buzz, right? And oh, yeah. You and I have been involved now with a few game launches and... Uh, when it's good, like, for example, the SOTOR one, like, it, the, the thing that's, that was kind of hard about that was they didn't have enough capacity in the sense that you got stuck in these queues. Yeah. I never had any problems with my game experience after that. Um, no. But the queues sucked. With this kind of stuff, you know, people are going to be able to get right in and play, and yeah. they're going to get some good stats. Because the other problem is when your beta is going down, you don't get all the details you need for the testing. Yeah. Because people aren't playing. So good on them. I'm looking forward to that. Yes. I don't know if I'm going to pick it up, but if you do, if you are out there, let me know if you like it and uh, consider using our affiliate link so uh, you give Jupiter Broadcasting a little something while you get yourself a little something. How could it be yeah. any better than that? I don't know. All right, Heather. Well, with that out of the way, I believe it's time for the news bite. That's right. We have more technology in medicine. We've spoken about it a little bit Last week, okay. about um, this is kind of nanotechnology beating medical diagnosis. Oh, interesting. So, I believe it was last week when we spoke. You know, you blow in the this essentially shoebox size thing, and it lights up green if it sees that you're right. You know, like it could it could diagnose like a bunch of different stuff, but it just had like a red or green light. And if you yeah. if it lit up, then you knew okay, I need to go in because it it flagged me for one of possible things. Yeah. Now this is a a different type. Um, very similar, but it uses, it has these biomarkers that attach and they glow when they're, when they hook onto something. No kidding. Yeah. So they have a little fluorescent glow. Now what happens is it, small glow is sometimes hard to see. So it, some of them are just, it's too faint to be detected. So what they've actually used now is some nanotechnology to greatly amplify, amplify the fluorescence. 
So you're able to do um, this material D2PA. It uh, it has glass. It's considered um, it's a whole bunch of glass pillars uh, in a layer of gold, speckled on their sides with gold dots and kept with a gold disc. Now I say pillars, but uh, the pillars are about 60 nanometers in diameter, like one one thousandth the width of a human hair. Whoa! Like a lot of little hair or. Hold out your hair. Yeah, a thousand could go across. So this that. is this is for serious nano territory. Oh yeah, this, this is, is tiny, right? Yeah, I mean it's not the tiniest of the tiny. No, but, this, but is, this is I mean so small that I wouldn't be able to like probably manipulate it in any sense or anything like that. No, so these are really you know really small. But what it does it is it increases the disease detection. Oh, by more than three million times. It increases the sensitivity because you can get I, more of them. Yeah. Ah. Uh, because you're able to see that much more clearly. Oh, oh, okay. They're able to to really look at it. Interesting. You know, think of um, I don't know, like a, you know, the television screen. Yeah. You know, think of it ac- well across the room. Right. Now, maybe you have a pair of uh, you know weak binoculars or something. You zoom in, and now <laughs> you see all the little, you know, dots. Little, you know, yeah, pixels or yeah, you, know, yeah. you see all the pixels and things. Yeah. So what this is doing is kind of, sort of allowing that kind of in reverse but it's allowing you to, to amplify everything so you can really count it's more like um it's uh, like higher is it is it like higher as so i guess when i said more of them i meant is it like more in the sense that there's more of them so it's a higher resolution in a sense because it's since there's more well, little so, things on there lighting up you it, it stands well, out I was more? thinking it's not so let's see um am i way off there i probably way off. no huh? i'm trying to round about to make sure that i haven't led science down a, a wrong path. <laughs> the, I'm kind of looking over my notes again. I'm you like, know, it reminds me of uh, Star Wars. It always goes back to Star Wars when Luke <laughs> is getting trained uh, by Yoda and there's that, that creepy cave that he has to go in. And that might have yeah. just been where Heather took science is all I'm saying. Oh, no. <laughs> well, no, it's, I mean, it's it's allowing the, the detection. You know, so it's like, you have a, a camera, very old school. Now you've upgraded to a really high def yeah, camera and yeah, exactly. you're able to see all the different little things much yeah. clearer. I think the pixel analogy is apt then. It's yeah. like higher density. It's, it's yeah, that's incredible. So, you know, this will be able to sample you know, blood, saliva, other things. And, you know, these little glass vials, you know, and any of the, you know, the antibodies hook up to the fluorescence. You know, so then they glow and anything not just kind of washes away. Hmm. So it's not like anything else is clouding your data. And they say it's it gives a that. three million. Is that, is that what you said? A three million yeah. fold improvement? Jeez, that's incredible. Yeah, over what we've had before. That's incredible. So it's all these kind of technologies are really, these nanotechnologies are really coming in where it's very quick, very compact, you know, diagnosis saying, hey, something's going on here. You know, and that kind of early detection, you know, quick early detection of things like cancer, of Alzheimer's, of any one of these things that you can get medication in somebody early or you can start treatment early, you know, for cancer or anything like that. So much better. Oh, yeah. Well, or also the flip side is simple and is simple and cheap is good for like, uh, oh, I don't know, humanitarian aid in Africa when you have, yeah. you know, 100 people that have come to a camp to get treatment and you just got to find out who's got what as fast as possible or if they even need your attention. Yeah, you know, you have the, the big triage area and it's, you know, drop of blood here, drop of blood here. Uh, okay, you go over here, you go over there. Yeah. You know, or, you know, blow in this, uh, you know, blow in the box. Uh, okay, right, you go over right. here. Right. Uh, according to this, you blew stupid, so uh, go over here. All right, next. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great, though, if you could have a breathalyzer for stupidity? And then you just know, like, you can interview somebody and be like, uh, before you work here, we just need you to blow into this real quick. Oh, man. And before you got married, too. You'd be if, like, you know. Well, I, I, I I don't know if the internet can feel the kind of ouch and hurt my face is. Really? And my braid. I'm you, like, oh, Chris. You wouldn't want a stupid test? I would. I, I, oh, my gosh. I, 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 would, I, would want to, I would I would definitely want to filter. I would want to filter everybody who I hired through. A, through, a, through hey, yeah, I'm just saying, Heather. I'm just saying. Uh, this is, it's not like a disease. Oh. I mean, it's not like that kind of a disease. 
you can treat, you know, I like, don't know. It's, I it, yeah, you're right. Because, you know, a disease, well, I mean, does, do diseases get passed genetically? I mean, they kind of do, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. I maybe kind of could be classified as a disease. That's all. That's all I'm saying. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right. Well, any other thoughts on that last story there? Oh. I don't know. I, I think uh, you've started in on the next story a little early. Oh, really? I, I think I think you've uh, been. Uh... You think I've been sipping on Guinness a little bit? I think so. <laughs> I think you were trying. You know, you, you always say you know you're bringing up a stuff and preparing for the next story. I think you started on this one a little <laughs> little early. <laughs> I think you did. Well, and who's to say I wouldn't fail the breathalyzer? So there's always that. Oh, that's okay. All right, what is um, this story? The rise and fall of Guinness bubbles. Now, this as you know, some people may know, um, the bubbles in a stout beer like Guinness settle. They go down. Yeah. Now, you know, a, a few years ago, I think in uh, 2004 or so, there's high-speed photography proved that they do indeed sink. It's not just a, a trick illusion or anything. So this has been looked at before so the, the science does does it bears this out yeah it bears it out okay now some uh in uh now a team of mathematicians from the university of limerick have actually uh put these through um simulations so you have uh mathematical simulations that kind of prove it through wow really through also really you know they say that um this is what they spend their the time on that's good for them, though. I, I find it oh, fascinating. I'm for them. <laughs> but oh, I mean, come man. on. Like, if you're working on science and somebody, so you say to somebody, yeah, I'm a scientist. And they say, so what do you, what do, you do? I study uh, Guinness bubbles. I, actually, that's not bad, actually. I take it back. It's not bad. <laughs> As like, except you can't like, that's all you can do is just like visualize it. Yeah. Or, you know, plug it in the programming. I'll take it. Really? Because, you know, I was about to harp <laughs> on them, but this is important. This actually is important stuff. Yeah, so it's all about the circulation. So it's really um, the huh. circulation patterns that are driving the fluid in the bubbles downward in the glass. Right, the bubbles okay. are still lighter, but it's um, for specific glass sizes. They kind of simulated it going, um, you know, various glass, you know, tilts this way and that way. You know, for a, a straight edge glass, you know, tilts to the side. Yeah. The, the bubbles can be seen, you know, rising on one side and falling on the other. Wow, I, I got to say, it actually makes such a big difference that you, uh, we, you know, doing beer is tasty. We'd always get yeah. this. We'd always get the feedback. You guys are using the wrong glass for that beer, and I, you know, it's we knew it. We know we did, but now you can kind of see why because the shape of it sort of changes the flow changes of the, the little the flow of the liquid, yeah. the, where the bubbles are. And the thing about these is that it's the stout beers because the stout beers, such as Guinness, the foam is a combination of carbon dioxide and nitrogen bubbles. You are making me Another, so freaking thirsty right now. Sorry, other beers are just uh, carbon dioxide. And now, if you're going to do any purchasing, we don't suggest uh, you uh, drive and purchase based on this story, but you should go through the Amazon link. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. Do they sell Guinness? They might. Oh, I don't know. I was I trying know. to make a joke. But that's good, though. Science right. isn't very good about jo making jokes. <laughs> I, don't I tell you that. I don't know about, I don't know about the science in my bubble. No. I don't know about science, but I, I do know about Heather. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. All no, right. <laughs> All right, let's talk about let's talk about this tomato story because this okay. is this as Crash has been saying in the chat room tonight. This is relevant to my interest. Um, yes, I actually have four tomato plants in my little garden right now. Aw, mm -hmm, awesome! Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love tomatoes. Uh, what when I was a uh, you know when I was a kid, a neighbor had a little potato tomato plants. Right. You know, and it was you know in the path that you know we'd park the car and we'd walk along. If my mom wasn't watching, but time we get to the door, Heather, did you steal tomatoes? No, <laughs> really? Like so they were like tomatoes, almost like candy like, to you. Little cherry tomatoes, I was popping them like candy. Interesting. But they have now, uh, you know, traced out the entire genome of the tomato. They sequenced uh, one of them from the Heinz 1706 tomato, as well as a wild relative of the tomato. So they've made, they now have uh, 35,000 genes arranged on 12 chromosomes. They have it all. So they've captured all the genes for like taste, pest resistance, nutritional content. Ah. They have all sorts of these. Now, this is the kind of thing where they've done it once and it was fairly expensive. But now that they've done it, it's a lot easier for other people to reproduce it. Who owns kind of the take... data? Um, Sorry. Oh, it looks like uh, salongnomics.com. Yeah. Right. Where are they? So they are, that's what they do. 
Interesting. Yeah. You can make those genomes. Now, what made it... They like do vegetables specifically, it looks like, too, potentially from their website. They sync when they're doing also uh, uh, peppers. Yes. Now, what was interesting is that going through this genome, they actually discovered that tomato is a fruit. Okay. Wow. There you go. Not a vegetable. The science is in. Science is in and it is a fruit. Which I was like, I'm not very good about vegetables. And I was like, I have tomatoes. And no, I don't have tomatoes. I do not. What was, oh, what I yeah, found, that, means, that, means it's, that means I have fruit in my vegetable garden. I didn't okay. think of that. Wow. Okay. Well, there's a problem, actually. So this is interesting. So yeah. uh, for, uh, the US, for, for U.S. schools, uh, yep. t- t- pizza has been classified as a vegetable because of the tomato sauce. <laughs> the tomato sauce. But now that we know that tomato is a fruit. Yep. It can't. They got to fix that again. Yeah, they'll they'll probably they need to look at it. Man, I feel bad for those bureaucrats. Just when they finally figured out a way to get the cheap pizza in, science comes along and screws it up again. And they can get away with ketchup as a as a vegetable. Nope, it is a fruit. So uh, no more spoonfuls. No more spoonfuls of ketchup. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) All right. But the most interesting part of of the whole genome thing story that I read Uh was that it shares ninety two percent. I have more than 34,000 protein codes with the potato, as in baked potatoes. 92%. Yep. They're very close relatives. Hmm. They're like cousins. But that's, so, boy, they're like our ape. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Uh, yep. So I wonder once they start sequencing things like onions and carrots, I'll be curious to see kind of what the, uh, or especially like carrots and potatoes, two things that grow down in the dirt. Yeah. Because you know a tomato, that's up on a that's up on a bush, up growing up. I mean, that's those are pretty different. Those are really different plants. Yeah, but I mean, just just sequencing the tomato, I mean, we can see that it's you know very close to the potato. But in addition, um, you know, it actually gives you an idea about other plants, uh, you know, plant species um, like of the fleshy fruits, like strawberries, apples, melons, bananas. So it gives you kind of an idea of whereabouts on the genome, mm. like the nutritional content and things like that, will be. So then it depends on, you know, farmers, do they, do they tweak things to be more nutritionally, you know, to up the nutritional and the pest resistance, you know, or do you try different breeds and then like put it through the genome sequencer? Right. You know, cause the first time it's a whole bunch of money and all the additional times it's only like, you know, in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands. Yeah. It's, it's significantly cheaper once the whole thing's been mapped out for, you know, for a few. Right. Right. Um, can I, can I, uh, can I interrupt for just a second? Can sure. I, can I, do you mind if I break the show? I really apologize about this. Um, Crash Benedict though, just pointed out in the chat room. I just wanted to give it a quick mention since we were talking about, can you buy Guinness on Amazon? You can. And there's oh. even a, there's even a Father's Day gift basket <laughs> of Guinness that you can buy. Uh, I'll, you know what? If you want to get that and, uh, use the Jupiter Broadcasting link, I'll put a link to that in the show notes too. That's hilarious. So <laughs> thanks to Crash. Anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Any other thoughts? Be responsible. Right. It's not for your father. Well, no, it's for if your father doesn't have to drink it in the car. Jeez, you know how not everybody <laughs> that drinks beer is going to drive immediately. We're not, well, we're, no, <laughs> but not everyone needs to consume alcohol either. No, consume- that's true. That's true. But if you're going to consume beer, Guinness is a good one. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, you ready to move on to the next story or any other thoughts? I think so. All right. Why don't we talk about something that I would love an opportunity to try, maybe even just to record a show, a room that's so quiet I wouldn't be able to stand it for more than 45 minutes? Nope. Hmm. This is, I kind of saw this story in passing. It was really recently in the last 24 hours or so. And it is a room that's surrounded like with double walls of concrete, insulated steel covered by three by three foot thick wedges of fiberglass. And it blocks out 99.99% of sound. Which would be really, uh, is if you've ever, I'm sure everybody's at least had some sort of weird opportunity to be for some reason be in some spot that's totally silent, but it's very eerie. Yes. And we were talking about it, uh, what is it, last week or the week before, about uh, you need the, the, this perfect amount of background noise to be able to increase your creativity and out-of-the-box thinking. Right. This is kind of going the, the opposite direction. I mean, this room is so quiet. You can actually, if you're, you can hear your own heartbeat, your stomach, inner ear sounds. You can, like, the sounds from a cell phone display, it actually emits a sound. You can hear those kind of things. 
Uh, I've heard of uh, like sensory deprivation tanks that are supposed to be also totally silent, but you float yes. in those. This is like a room. You would do something like this generally if you wanted to measure very precisely the amount of sound that something generated. Yeah, this would be more useful for that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are people that, you know, have tried to go in and, you know, be like, oh, cool, quiet room. You know, but it, what it does is it throws off your balance, you know, your senses. It really throws everything off. And some people actually call it hallucinations. Mm-hmm. And like no one has been able to sit in there for more than 45 minutes. This is the guy who's created this will, you know, go in and do things, but for no more than 30 minutes at a time. What will he do? Do you know? Taking measurements? I don't know. Like I didn't get into enough of the story because it, it was a really short story and it was kind of weird. I was like, whoa, really quiet room, creepy. Interesting. I wonder if he goes in there and trips out or something. Like oh he just totally God. gets all freaked out. Uh, he <laughs> added that uh, academic ap- academic uh, market researchers and cognitive psychologists have proven the conclusion that focus groups contradict traditional resource because uh, you get the feeling of disassociation. Mm-hmm. Uh, feelings have a great predictive value, but opinions don't. So he goes on to say that he goes in there and yeah, I guess, huh? He goes in there to do all kinds of things. Yeah. So he's, it's- got, he's got he actually builds them for people too. Yeah, I this, mean... This is wow. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are certain things, like you were saying, that you want, uh, you know, technology or in the technical fields that you need. You need somewhere absolutely as quiet as you can get, you know, to do specific experiments or, you know, various things. But for people, I guess it allows some psycholo- you know, some psychological tests or of things of that nature. I'd love to try the challenge for 45 minutes. I just like the opportunity to try it. Just, I, I wouldn't be going for any time limit. I would just be like in there just to check it out. I go in. I go in for as long as I thought I could take it, and I don't think I probably forty five minutes wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to make it. I don't think, but I no. give it a shot. It's like I, I'd chill and not worry about it. Be like, all right, I'm done. Yeah. Where, where's the button for out? Yeah, yeah. And it was it was one of the things where part of the story is he and somebody else were in there, and he tried to talk to the other person, just like normally, and the other person could barely hear their voice from like I don't know three feet away or so because it wasn't bouncing around or anything. Yeah, it wasn't bouncing around. It wasn't doing anything. Everything was just sucking up the sound. Mm. It's pretty weird. It's like a like a, some sort of weird room. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, do we uh, have we talked about tornadoes very much on this show? I don't think so. Well, it's time we fix often. that, huh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So this one is most interesting if you check out um, picture in the show notes or check out the you know enhanced audio vis- version. Visual, mm-hmm. Yep. Now a uh, a data tech a tech blogger went uh, using information from data.gov had a, created this image of tornado paths in the U.S. over the last fifty six years. You now, so they're in the categorizations, you know, of the different F scales. You know, it's an F two tornado, it's an F three and F four. So he separated those out by the brightness of the the line. You know, so the brighter the neon line, the vi- more violent the storm. Now uh-huh. you see, you know it's all the ones tracked, you know, that we have. Now, there are a whole bunch of straight little lines, and lots of people know that the tornadoes don't follow a line. They don't mm. color inside the lines all the time. Yeah. But they're straight because it took the start point and the end point. And that's all it did. So that's what the data the data kind of gave. Here's where it started. Here's where it stopped. Oh, okay. So it was, you know, very easy for him to say, okay, connect the dots, and that's what it is. It's and so a- you can see all the stats of how many of different um, a different F categories have happened. You kind of see in the U.S. as a picture where you don't want to be. There's like this swath yeah. across, uh, you know, East Central U.S. That's just like, wow. I didn't realize cool. Texas got so many uh, tornadoes. Yep. Yeah, I uh, grew up in East Texas. Uh, I didn't I'd been on. Torn- I'd been eyes on eyes on the sky for uh, my mom a couple times. A tornado actually hopped over my elementary school <laughs> while I was there. Well, that's fortunate, I guess. Yeah, went straight for the elementary school, lifted off the ground, went over the elementary school, and came back down. I see maybe one tornado, maybe in my in the in the Pacific Northwest area of Washington. Yeah, is that maybe like a? I've never heard of a tornado here in my life. Yeah, well, it's over the last fifty six years. I, so I'm just see, saying, you know, I would not uh, look at this. Look at the East Coast versus the West Coast. I mean, this dramatic oh, difference. Oh yeah, huge difference. And on the East Coast, there's this. You know, you see all these in just kind of the chunk of dark, yeah. like in the middle. And it's, I think it's the Appalachians is what it is. Mm-hmm. And so it's just funny because you can really visualize, you know, like, where am I? And you're either going sweet or, oh, yeah, that is me. But it was a really interesting image. So I, 
you know, I know this is the audio cast, so I try to stick away from you know, the heavy <laughs> image, the heavy visual stories. But this is one that was neat enough that I, I kind of had to point it out and just like, hey, this is kind of crazy. And it was all using um, free data that was out there. I on, like that. You know, so it's, you know, a big chunk of database and you can just, anyone can go and decide they want to slog through lots of data and pull this kind of thing out. Right. I... First of all, I love it because, you know, taxpayer dollars paid for that data to essentially get collected and then made available yep. online. So that's yep. a win right there uh, because, yep. you know, that's good use of taxpayer dollars. Now, what I what I find kind of interesting about it, though, is how um, that really seems like a lot of activity. And it, to me, I don't know, it just kind of blows my mind that, uh, that, that that's just such a unique difference, difference between the two coasts. And it's something I never have to deal with. <laughs> and but you know but like there's people there's people in my own country that deal with tornadoes all the time oh yeah i mean you know how many times or how many every few years do you hear like this town um is pretty much non-existent now right you can kind of sort of halfway erase it off the map yeah for a year or two yeah pretty nuts well any other thoughts on that one no it's just one of those things where you hear about tornadoes you know hitting there or hitting there but this was a great visualization about um you know, the strength and, and where they happen. It's been a stormy 50 years, that's for yes. sure. Yes. Well, it know. has. All right, why don't we take, uh, before we go on, we'll yes. take another pause. Yeah. And uh, I want to I uh, mention the Jupiter signal. I mention that about once a month here on SciBite, and that's because uh, the next edition will be coming out next week, and uh, we have an announcement that we'll be making Ooh. in the Jupiter signal. So uh, last week's Jupiter, or last month's Jupiter signal is already out, and uh, it's a good read. Lots of good details in there. And uh, next, this month, which will be out next week, will be one you won't want to miss. So uh, you can go over to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal. Or if I'm really on top of things, which I probably won't be tonight, I'll try to remember to put a little spot in the show notes where you can sign up. Um, although the SiteBite audience is awesome. Like they, they, Most people that listen on a regular basis have already signed up. But if you haven't yet, this will be one you want to grab. So again, that's bit.ly slash Jupiter signal, or hopefully I'm a good boy and I put a little thing in the show notes for you. All right, Heather. Yeah. All right. I feel like it's time to do a spacecraft update. I think so. This week we've got a couple of them. Uh, we've been talking a lot of private, you know, space travel. But yeah, yeah. this week we're going to put a little bit of a shine on uh, Virgin Galactic. Okay. You know, they've been kind of in the shadow, not in the limelight so much this last little week. Well, yeah. But Spaceship 2 has now received its perm. A permit from the FAA to do um, rocket powered tests. Okay. So they're going to so, be competing with uh, with uh, SpaceX? A different kind of system. I mean, these Spaceship t- uh, 2 is more about offering people the ability to essentially buy a seat right. to kind of right. go up and right. come back down. Just so you right. can say, I am, that is the most awesome, cool day of my entire life. I was in space. Right, we've kind of so, talked about this, sort of like, yeah, it's tourism, space tourism. Yeah, it's space tourism. So this is, you know, designed to lost six passengers, two pilots. You know, you get a couple minutes of weightlessness and you come back down. So it's one of those things where it's like, it's not that big, but oh my gosh, would that be big? Well, and Holly would be huge for Hollywood. Oh, well, yeah. Think of space movies, they'd, they'd rent one of these things for, the, for however long. Yeah, well, um, Apollo 13. Yep, that's what I was thinking. You know, Tom Hanks, of. what they did is... Um, some people may know of the, uh, I don't know it's properly name, I don't the- off the top of my head, but it's <laughs> commonly known as the Vomit Comet. Right. <laughs> Big jumbo plane, just yeah. goes up and down, you know, and on the down, it kind of, you're kind of in free fall. Yeah. And they actually used uh, that to get some of their, you know, some they're of the in best, space. Some of the best no. Apollo 13, like in the capsule shots and stuff. Yes, yeah, I mean, the in- capsule things are floating around this way or that way. Yeah. It wasn't just, you know all CG. It was actually, let's put everybody in this plane. All right, everyone's done being sick. All right, now climb in and get ready to, for the shoot. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, that was one of the comments that one of the actors made is they had a scene where they somebody got a little space sick and it's like, I, I was feeling a little space sick actually. Yep. Yeah. But so the Spaceship 2 has done some tests. You know, they've done some glide-in tests and now they've actually got the, you know, they have permission to do powered flight testing. You know, so they can do rocket propelled testing later this year. Now, what they're going to start off doing is kind of bring out their, you know, their glider test, kind of revamp it up, kind of retest with the weight. Does this thing's wings move so that it falls yes. harder? 
<laughs> like it looks like it, it like they're so they're they're sort of amping up the weightlessness effect inside by like they they really jam themselves into it and then they then they pin the wings up and it just falls. Yeah, it's it is or a fall uh, glides. I mean, it's kind yeah. of like this interesting. It's not yeah, really it quite is an falling. interesting pivoting wing uh, technology. So like a bird of prey. Yeah, like a bird of prey. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Well, it kind of is. I mean, that's fascinating. Yeah, but they're gonna put all the weights in sort of a you know a dummy rocket weight into it, finish their gliding tests, then slowly kind of um, amp it up and start doing its getting ready for its rocket propelled test this autumn. Cool. They're they're moving forward with things too. Well, there you go. I'm sure we'll be covering it on SciBite, right? Oh, yes. So they're going more consumer route, but yes. as they develop this technology, I, I I will not be surprised at all when we come on a future SciBite and you say, well, uh, Virgin America has struck a deal, or Virgin Galactic has struck a deal with NASA to supply, I mean, seriously, I, I, I think that'll be a direction they go eventually once they get past mm-hmm. this phase. Well, I know uh, SpaceX has... You know, it has its uh, its dragon that we'll talk about here in a few minutes, but it is also uh, in the works of a Orion capsule, which is for towing or carting around, I think, six astronauts at a time. Mm. And that was one of the things that uh, this, uh, you know, this last week, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to put myself on hold. I'm going to wait because I could do it to talk about the dragon here in a few minutes. Right. Right. But yeah, so it's, it's something that they're working on, too. Fascinating times. All right, well, why don't we talk about this uh, NASA lunar spacecraft, Grail? Because we've uh, we've talked about Grail. Um, gosh, yes, early times. this year. Yeah. yeah, it you know it blasted off and it met the moon in early January. It was one of those New Year's Day, New Year's Eve things. Right, Sidebite twenty seven. Right, if memory serves. Yeah, I'm not I think so. The, I'm not cheating. I'm not looking at the show notes oh, at all. No, totally no. not. No. We we just go off the top of our head with these uh, <laughs> remembering the dates. And the numbers of these things were right. just that. Right. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, and then, uh, so now they have entered, you know, I mentioned before, you know, they only have so much of a mission because it's solar panels and what happens during, uh, you know, a specific eclipse that actually happened this last week. You know, did, how much energy did they lose? Well, and right, as, yeah. so as of March 8th, it actually already, um, you know, operated for like, 89 days. Yeah. It collected data from the entire surface of the moon three times. Mm. It's delivered back to Earth like 99.99% of the data that has been collected. Wow. And now it has been giving an extension. Oh, really? Yep. It actually got, uh, it got permission to extend it starting August 30th all the way through December 3rd. Oh. So they're going to keep, you know, going on their main. So the power levels right. are looking solid enough. They yep, think it'll last that long. The power levels are looking solid. So they're going to continue their mission. And during the extension, what they're going to do is they're going to take an even lower orbit. Oh, yeah. So just like 14 miles. Getting a little riskier because now we yeah. got extra time. Yeah. They're going to be clearing like some of the highest peaks on the moon by five miles. Right. Yeah. So wow. they're, they're getting down pretty low. Wow. Yeah. Close as they can to like. Get even more uh, defined details about. So we could see even exactly. better photos of the landing spot and stuff coming back. Now, remember, this is not the one that has photography. This is studying. The oh, lunar right, gravity. right. This is uh, right. ebb and flow. The ones that are locked in, right. they're kind of checking the gravity of the moon to kind of yes. tell us what's going on. This now, is the does- one where I was like, "What do you mean they didn't put cameras on it?" And you're like, "Well, they had to cut it to make room for the gravity measurement instruments." Yeah, yeah. You, you pick one or the other. Now there yeah. is a camera on. Board, oh. uh, the moon cam. It's uh, students go through and they submit, you oh, know, yeah. what they take a picture of, and mm-hmm. it takes things. Uh, you know, I think the first picture of it came back, and it was, you know, the Earth over the moon. Right. Uh, and now over seventy thousand of these images have been taken. Seventy thousand. Yes, and with the extension, um, there's going to be a chance for even more of these to be taken. You know, for oh, students yeah. oh, on yeah. and you know, be able to check out pictures and say hey we we want to take this picture or that picture so it, it, it's great it's got the the science going on it's got you know some some stuff with kids saying hey cool look at this getting yeah. them interested so yeah i mean could you imagine being a student in school and having the opportunity to to take a picture of the moon i yeah. mean wow that close i wish they'd open it up just on the internet in general I, <laughs> that's how nasa ought to get their funding 
right there, right? Yeah. NASA just needs to open this up. Let me PayPal them five bucks so I can take my picture. Or heck, sell it as an <laughs> app. And put it in the Android marketplace and, and make me buy a four ninety nine app. And then when I buy it, I can take a picture of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> or you can, you know, put a marker and be like, hey, I want this one. And then if it ever, you know, the opportunity comes up, hey, you won your award. Here's your picture. <laughs> Yep, yep. All right, Heather. Well, uh, so we talked a little bit about it, but I think it's time we move on to the topic of the Dragon spacecraft. Yes. Busy week. Big week. Oh, my gosh. Have I been excited about this one the last couple of weeks? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's, it kept on going. Oh, yeah. Uh, last week, it, it had just connected with the right. You know, the, the space station. Right. So it was ready to go. Yeah. And uh, so they, you know, they had it. They did a whole bunch of unloading over the Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. And now... They released it on May 31st. It has spent um, five days, 16 hours, five minutes, to be precise, attached to the space station. So then it was released. There it goes. Wow. And it, yep, there he, And then it, you know, fired its thrusters and sent it plumbing down to Earth through atmosphere. You know, it saw temperatures of over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit and went through deorbit burn. Now, remember, this is not one that was going to burn up coming in mm -hmm. this is one that had a little heat shield and mm -hmm. had parachutes it's gonna land in the ocean so and it did it had the drogue parachutes deployed at like forty-five thousand feet slowed it down then they helped remace the two main parachutes about 116 feet in diameter um you know mm -hmm. it made a water landing off the coast of baja california um mexico about 560 you know, miles southwest of los angeles and then, you know, take about two days to deliver everything um, from the port of Los An to the port of Los Angeles. And some of the high critical stuff was sent to, um, sent to Houston ahead of time. Now, something cool is I actually got to watch it incoming live. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I was actually able to tune in and I had, you know, the little live stream. And, you know, so it was like spotting planes. You know, they had a couple of NASA spotting planes flying around, you know, trying to keep an eye on it. Oh, I bet. Had, I bet. You know, the, the recovery ships kind of prepped into sort of where they thought and they were actually able to catch it on on some radar pictures and sort of follow it down and I could actually see it kind of falling and then see the two little um, drogue parachutes come out and then like the big... The big boys. The big parachutes come out and there is a video in the show notes of a um, a kind of a cleaned up version of what I saw. It was a little bit, what I saw was a little bit harder to, to make out, to make but they out, went through yeah. and they, you know, they tweaked the, the video of it and made it a lot clearer, but you can see it coming down and, oh my gosh, if you, uh, if you were watching my, uh, my Twitter account, you saw me going on like, oh my gosh, check this picture out. Oh my gosh, check this picture <laughs> out. Good for you. Good for you. What is so, your Twitter account? Give it a, give it a mention. It's JB underscore Mars underscore base. A lot of underscores in that one. I'm going to be honest yeah. with you. A lot of underscores. That's okay. And there's, you know, pictures of, you know, is it land in the ocean? They kind of spot it off in the distance. That's awesome. You know, and like what it looked like as they were coming in to make the recovery and all those kind of things. Um, you know, I realized too, we've, we, I've heard some people say this really isn't a big deal, uh, you know. Private industry has been involved in space travel since the very beginning, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, things like that. Uh -huh. Well, uh, but I think it is because these A are, it's a small independent startup or, a, you know, it's a startup at least. Yeah. And also, uh, this really is an industry specific for this. We are seeing, we yeah. are now living in a time where there is a company that is building spacecrafts with the intention of going to space. And that's what they do. They don't also yeah. have this massive jet plane division and these fighter jet plane divisions that they run. They are just a space travel company. Yeah, I mean, this is delivery, you know, so they can, this is one of those where it is actually the first thing that can go up, deliver, come down for a splash landing. You know, so they came back down with a whole bunch of trash and miscellaneous things, but also, you know, science experiments, you know, those kind of things that are finished and they need to bring them down and be able to take those down. You know, it took a couple, you know, at max a day or two. For that, leave the space station, come down, and be able to have enough time for the, in the retrieval to take them out. Mm -hmm. And then some of the stuff they sent on in Na to NASA Houston right away. So some of these maybe biological things, you know, you know, blood or things like that that they could kind of store, you know, for a day or two, and then get them there much so much quicker. So you can analyze the the results using Earth technology. You know, these big equipment pieces that can't really fly on the space station. 
So it's all these kind of things. And it that ability to do that is is amazing. I mean, it's also like the first US, you know, spacecraft to dock with the space station since last early last year. Yeah, that's also it's, nice. It's, Just the fact that we're getting back up there. Yeah, we're getting back up there. It's not NASA, but it is it is the US, you know, where and it's it's another opportunity. You know, the Russians are going up there. And that is great with our Soyuz capsules and being mm-hmm. able to come back down. Mm-hmm. But the more opportunities to be able to go up and come back down, the better, the more options you have. And uh, SpaceX is also working on a Orion capsule, I mentioned a few minutes ago, mm-hmm. where it is this sort of thing, like essentially the Dragon capsule, its cousin or its sibling, where it's not decked out to carry equipment. It's decked out to carry astronauts. People peoples so it's dicked out for six people and so one of the things that they did while unloading last weekend was kind of all six members of the space station right sort of ended up inside this there at the same time right you know and they're like you know it's not really that bad no they they did like a webcast from it right or something like that and well yeah when when two of them were in there i know uh one of the astronauts i don't recall if i mentioned it last week said you know when all six of them were in there at the same time, you know, and like, you know, it was, it was a little, it wasn't too roomy, but it was roomier than the Soyuz. <laughs> we, we had more room to move, to move around than we do there. So, well, I, you know, I mean, to be fair, they probably don't have to, they don't necessarily build them for comfort, do they? So they probably uh, just figure, uh, well, this is, you know, it's technology of a specific type. You know, if you have all of the industry to build something, why do you want? you might not want to crash the whole system and start from scratch again. Right. So, you know, their whole industry is made for that specific way. Mm -hmm. Now, SpaceX is kind of making its own roundabout path and saying, this is what we want to do. You know, we have all this equipment. We can shuttle up. We can come back down. We can, you know, send people up and maybe come back down safely. So it's, it's a new industry. And I, I do really like the private industry part of this. I mean, for so many reasons we've talked about before. But NASA can now essentially pay them like a rental fee, like you rent a car almost. You know, like, you know, or a moving van. You know, you, they pay them. Right. It's like their U-Haul. <laughs> it's like U-Haul. SpaceX is their U-Haul, dude. Wow. You know, they, they call, it's like a whole moving company. They like ship them, you know, their equipment. They take it. They take it up to the space station. The astronauts kind of unload and load and they come back down. Mm-hmm. You know, or they bring, you know, astronauts back and forth. So the ability to pay them for this, one, it gets, you know, SpaceX is a private, you know, private company. They actually have the money. They can use it to do to that or extend other technology. And you know, NASA gets a deal out of it, too. Yeah. They don't have to start this whole new. Oh, it's way cheaper for them. Oh, yeah. Incredibly not to start everything from scratch. They can just do this. They can do their own thing on the side as well. Parallel. You know, parallel interests going yeah. at the same time, but this is is really exciting, and I I think the 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 dragon t- excitement is pulling down a little bit. I, I think it's lowering. It's been like rising, yeah. going crazy over the last couple it's, weeks. Well, now like, now it's oh gosh, like oh gosh. it's like it's okay. We've proven it. It can be done yeah. now. So uh, it came now down it's pretty much exactly where they thought it would. Right. It was all pretty smooth, wasn't it? Oh yeah, really smooth. Uh, I kind of. I kind of laughed at myself because I, I got the latitude and longitude coordinates of where it landed. I plugged them into Google Maps. I made a shortcut and I plugged that into my Twitter. I'm like, check out where it landed. It was like in the middle of the ocean. There's a little little flag that says <laughs> dragon landed about here. Nice. So, yeah, I was kind of hyped up when it came down that day. Yeah, I was pretty excited, too. And I mean, I am still excited. Now I just want to see more. I want to yeah. do more. Uh, yep. All right. It is here. Should we uh, should we move on to the next one? Or, I think so. You know what that means, actually, is you better step into the time machine. Here, I'll come right here. I think so. Get All, right. Door. All right, here we oh. go. Gosh, okay. Wow. Wow. Oh, that was a good ride. That took us 190 so. years ago, June 9th, 1822. Something amazing happened this week in science, didn't it, Heather? Yes. The first patent for false teeth. Where's my teeth? Yes. Now, they weren't the full, first false teeth ever used. I mean, even the colonial years, rotten teeth, you know, considered by, by many illnesses, you know, they'd have to be extracted. Um, for example, George Washington had at least four sets of false teeth. 
None of them wouldn't, despite, you know, right. all stories to that. But the, the first pair of dentures were actually made using human teeth, inserted into carved ivory. Then uh, a dentist made him another set from gold, hippo teeth, um, hip and hippo and elephant ivory. I like the story I read or like the little history blurb I read was like the one natural remaining tooth was a molar. <laughs> and like he had his false teeth and a hole was left for that one little molar to poke through. <laughs> and I read that I was like, you know, you know, these these figures in historical, you know, you think like you read about them in history books and you study them in your little classroom and you're right. like, right, he had one tooth. You know, I don't remember that in my. Uh, it doesn't my come history. up, does it? It doesn't come no, up. Doesn't but come up. that was the uh, that was the that's how the situation of their time was, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, false teeth are still needed today. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I feel like I'm going to need get get me a set of wood teeth. Uh, <laughs> all right. Why don't we jump to uh, 75 years ago, June 8th, 1937? The Titan Arum. I think I probably did not say that right. It's a specimen <laughs> of the world's largest flower this thing measures eight and a half feet high Ooh. and four feet in diameter oh that, that is a big flower isn't it yeah it first bloomed in the u.s in the new york botanical gardens um you don't want to be anywhere in this stuff smell this flower oh, really? not not something you want to stop and smell the roses really what happens putrid rotten corpse fragrance what no yes this is known as the corpse flower in the Sumatran jungles of Indonesia. And it started in the U.S., though? No. Uh, oh. The first Western expert to find it was um, uh, in, you know, 1878. And then he sent seeds back to um, Italy. Yeah. And a couple of them were grown. The first of those seedlings flowered in 1887. Why does it smell so bad, though? I don't know. Oh, it's Really? Just- Oh, I thought you were going to tell me. I, now no, it's a mystery? No, no, my guess would be, no, it's not a mystery. You know, botanists know. No, I must um, know. I'm going to go see if I can find out. Okay, so my guess weird. would be it is, it's protection. Many of these flowers are either bringing in or sending away. They're bringing in the, the bees to pollinate, the you know insects to pollination, or they're driving away things that want to eat them. Okay, yeah, I guess so. so maybe huh? that is a combination of trying to hook in something that rotten, wants the rotten flesh smelling that thinks that's awesome or maybe it's sending things away. That's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because maybe an animal wouldn't want to mess with it. Yeah. Because it is kind of big. It has, to, it has to deal with a larger type of animal than most kind of flowers. Yeah. The corpse flower. There you go. So, wow. That's The that's first a, one uh, bloomed in the U.S. 75 years ago. That's an important milestone. All right. Well, uh, it's been a busy week, but why don't we talk about looking up into the sky now? Oh my gosh, today was, talked about it last week. Talked about it at the top of the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've spoken about it a couple times leading up this year, kind of preparing people what was going to happen. Talked, you know, quite a bit about it last week. Uh, and then it happened today. Actually, it's happening still right now. Is it? The people in the chat room are saying that it's over now. Oh, but I don't know. It's probably over. I you know, know, I wasn't paying attention to stop because it continued after the sunset here. So, yeah, yeah. that's okay. You actually had it up on the live stream before the show today. I did. As I mentioned at the top of the show, so- it, was, it was very cool to, to watch that actually in real time because I didn't have the, the conditions here. And, of course, now yeah. we're doing the show. So, yeah. Now, of course, since it just happened today and it was happening in progress while I was making the show notes, I don't have a whole bunch of imagery. I do have one uh, picture gallery. I'll probably have some more stuff next week, you know, you know, so the best best and various things. It was streaming all over the place. Uh, mm-hmm. But I actually, one of the ways that, you know, in the show notes last week about how to view it was, you know, putting a pair of binoculars, you know, put a little cardboard box around them, shine it down onto a piece of paper. And I did that. Oh, yeah? I did it today. I had my binoculars and I had a coworker that had a tripod. So we hooked the two things up and I, you know, had the, the cardboard box. And I shone it down to a piece of paper and I actually was able to get enough distance that the sun was about, I don't know, a foot, a little over a foot in diameter. Wow. So it was out, that was right at the start and it was really sunny. So I was able to shine it down on this big, you know, construction paper like you use for a science fair as a kid. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you could actually, I got the focus where you could see it very clearly in a very defined black spot right near the edge of the sun. Hmm. And so then, you know, I had a couple of coworkers there, you know, I, I told on the way back and everybody had been looking at me strange because I had my, my setup kind of <laughs> working together, you know, yesterday I had my binoculars and I had my little cardboard that I cut out and, you know, I was putting these together and everyone was kind of walking over to my desk, looking at these binoculars and be like, bird watching? Like, oh, planet watching. Planet watching. <laughs> so I had it set up this after, you know, this early this afternoon, you know, before the end of the day. And so I had it shining down, you know, a couple of people came by. Oh, cool. And then they go away. And then like four other people would come in. What was it? Um, I think somebody's girlfriend came to pick them up and they came over. Uh, somebody's wife and son nice. mysteriously showed up. Checked out, uh, checked out the little Venus transit, huh? Yep. Now it did get, it started getting cloudy partway through. Hmm. So, um, you know, at the right at the start, I could shine it all the way down. You know, you know, it was like, I don't know, three three and a half feet to a piece of paper because it was just so bright it was able to shine down on there. Now, as the clouds kind of came and went, that was like a hole in the clouds to start with. It was great for those minutes that it did that. Right. And then it's kind of poking in between the clouds. So then I had, we got a piece of paper and we held it up closer, maybe six inches to a foot away. And so, you know, people could come up and sit next to it. Oh, yeah. And you could very clearly see a black dot. Now, when I was able to shine it really big and it was really bright, I could actually see the black dot and I could actually see in some of the pictures, you see a couple of those sunspots. There's two major ones. I was actually able to see the sunspots as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those, those are. So I could see I could see the sunspots, and then I saw a nice, perfect little black circle. Oh, check this out. Fort in the IRC chat room uh, used a, a similar technique, and he just sent in a picture, and there's a little black dot on his. He also looks like he can see the sunspots. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's about, that's kind of uh, about the same place that I was able to take mine in. Uh, it's in my camera who is deciding to take... Uh, May have decided to take a long walk off a short pier today, but I actually got one image out of it before it, it decided to uh, throw a hissy fit. But Aww. I got to see it. I got to take one picture. So uh, when I get that up, I will have it somewhere for the peoples to see. Maybe on your Twitter. A 144 millimeter telescope. Oh, wow. Nice. So everybody go follow JB underscore Mars underscore base if you want to get yes. that. Uh, well, very exciting. Um, yes. And what I, one of the things I'm I'm kind of hoping we we hear some details about next week is I remember you said that they were using the opportunity of Venus of the Venus transit to get the data of sort of its atmosphere and to see if yes. it confirms what we look at at exoplanets. Yep. So hopefully some of that will be coming out over the week and we can talk about that next week. It may. That kind of data may take a little while to go oh, well, it, okay. to process. Oh, come on, Heather. I want something exciting. There's seven hours of data from the Hubble to go through and to clean up. Right. It, Right. They probably have quite a bit of point data. One, point 0.1% of the sunlight, I believe, was actually Venus atmosphere. Well, so it might take a little while. Yeah, to just send it over to you. Maybe you could help them out. <laughs> in, in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, In my right. oh, copious amount of spare time right. when I'm not eating, sleeping, playing side door, side biting, working. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Was there extra time in between any of those? I don't remember. Maybe not. Maybe not. I hadn't really thought it all through. Yeah, it's I okay. guess we'll just have to be patient. That's okay. We can be patient. Yeah. I guess. So, of course, all the, uh, a lot of the image galleries and videos and stuff will be up by next week. And then we'll kind of keep an eye out for as the data comes in uh, over time. And I'll make sure to, to bring any of it up. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, there's some other things going on up in the sky this week, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, Venus kind of took a lot of the, a lot of the glory this week. Yeah. Uh, most of the glory of the sky. Uh, on Wednesday, June the 6th. Saturn is going to be in the southwest evening sky, and Spica, which is the uh, you know the bright, brightest star, is going to be below it. So you'll see two bright objects. Saturn is in the southwest. Saturn is the one on top. Spica is a star below it, and that's pretty much the highlights of this week. Yeah, Venus is the star, isn't it? Uh, Saturn. Did I say Venus? I meant Saturn. Oh, Saturn's going to be the star. Well, I meant the Venus oh, wait. transit. I just meant that. That's what I'm really thinking about. Oh yeah, yeah. Venus yeah. was the was the was the star player this week. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that of today. But in in the coming week, right? We, we've got Saturn in the southwest. That crown will then, yeah, exactly. That crown will be transferred. Yeah, you know, it, it'll pass on. All right, Heather. Well, I think that's the whole show right there. I think so. All right. Well, uh, thank you. That was that was a great show, and I I learned huh. lots. And of course, I got my uh, my spacecraft fix and my Venus. Yes. Fix. Boy, this is a good episode. 
Oh, all, it was so awesome. I got all my fixes. All right. Well, uh, and of course, thank you to everyone for tuning in. We do this live over at jblive.tv on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. And then it comes out Wednesday morning. So uh, be sure to tune in and catch that. All right, Heather. Well, I guess we'll chat with you next week. All righty. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much. See you next week, too.